On this episode, I'm joined with a very special guest, international grand champion of magic, illusionist Greg Fruin. He is very well known for incorporating birds and tigers into his illusion performances. His awards include first place at the International Brotherhood of Magicians, the Gold Medal of Excellence at IBM, and first place at the Society of American Magicians Annual Magic Convention Competition. Welcome to the show, Greg Fruin. You've had a very successful show in Niagara Falls, Canada. What inspired the name of your show, Wild Magic? Well, actually, it was a, a French photographer that I had come here to do one of our photo shoots. And he said, you know, you're on stage, you've got this energy that's kind of wild, and you work with animals, it's kind of wild. And he says, in his French accent, he says, you should be called Wild Magic. And I'm not great at accents, so sorry. <laughs> but that's sort of where it came from. And I went, what a great title. I've never heard that before. And so we adapted that, and so it just became our uh, our home title name. Wow, that's quite the story. You have a true love for animals. Can you tell me about your involvement with the SPCA? Yeah, so I'm now, I've worked with the SPCA for the last 15 years here. We've always tried to help out. We've had donation boxes here. We've tried our best to do as much to get the word out and support. And over the years, we've had a great relationship with them. And now I'm actually the vice chairman of our Niagara SPCA board. And so I do a lot of work behind the scenes and I try to help out wherever I can. It's a lot of work, but I will say this, and I, did, I wouldn't have thought this when I first started this path, but the rewards are amazing. When we get to see these animals that have either been abused and, and or neglected and left alone, and then to be able to see their path and get to the point where they find their forever home, even magic doesn't give me that special feeling that that does. You have many different breeds of animals in your show. Can you tell me their names and something about their personalities? Wow, that's gonna be a while. How long is this show? <laughs> We're gonna be here for a bit. Uh, yeah, we have several different animals. We have Chuck the Duck, of course, who ends up being the star of the show, which is really strange. Uh, over the years, I've rescued several, well, many parrots, and several of them have stayed in my show. As a matter of fact, uh, just like your lovely bird on your shoulder there, or on your arm, uh, one of my, parrots is an umbrella cockatoo I rescued in Nassau in the Bahamas back almost 23 years ago and she's still with me uh, so her name's Maya I have a parrot named Magic uh, we have a rescue uh, um, blue and gold macaw um, and uh, her name's Mika we have uh, what am I missing now some tigers in the show that are my babies we started out in the past many many years ago I've been doing this 26 years now and we did some rescue work I actually learned and took a lot of my training for uh, animal training from a gentleman that was in the movie industry. And uh, any movies like Gladiators or any of the big motion, major motion pictures you've seen with tigers, he was the guy, one of the best in the business. So we started out working together. Now I raise and, and we breed our cats and uh, they're my babies, uh, as you probably saw the other night. Uh, there's a lot of affection that goes in, a lot of time and effort. So we have uh, Rocky, we have uh, Shira, we have, uh, I'm trying to make sure I get all the names right, Nikita, who's our one you met the other night, she's our youngest, she's just about eight months now, and Tara, who's one of our uh, beautiful females, that uh, female mamas that we love so much. And then I've got uh, many rescue dogs. We have four rescue dogs in our home that are not part of the show, and we have some rescue horses. We have 40 acres of Lots of animals, lots of work. <laughs> well, with your elite talent as a performer, you could work in any market you wanted. Uh, why did you choose to stay in Niagara Falls, Canada, as opposed to going to the United States or other countries? Well, that's a great question. And actually, we kind of did that, my wife and I. We started out many years ago. I was born in Stony Creek, not too far from here. 
And we, we worked on cruise ships. We lived in the Bahamas for two years. We spent a year in Malaysia. Uh, we got to travel all over Europe. Um, we've pretty well been 80, I think we counted it up once, 85 to 90 countries we've worked in. So we've wow. kind of done that. We lived in Las Vegas for eight years, but it was always like anything. It's never home. You can make a home, but it's not your, you know, your true home where you're grown up and all your family and all your relatives are. So we just decided as we started to get into having kids and, and um, raising our own family, we made a conscious choice to look to see if we could ever come back and, and come home and, and set roots here, which we were able to do about 16 years ago now. So it's been great. It's been so awesome to be back in Canada and uh, here in Niagara Falls. So we just love it. Now, two days ago, I came to see one of your shows and it was very busy. Everyone loved it. Why do you think there's such a draw to your shows? Well, I think, uh, I mean, magic is a very international art form and there's no real age boundary either. Like if you think of music, you know, rock music might be for a certain genre. You got your jazz, country, but magic kind of, we don't have any boundaries that way in the sense of age or nationality or, you know, magic's a very, very wide uh, audience base. So, you know, we've been very fortunate to have great audiences and a uh, great response to our show. And I think it also goes hand in hand with the amount of magic that we get to see visually on TV and on the internet. Uh, I do a lot of TV myself, but there's a lot of magicians around the world that are on different shows. And so the awareness for magic is very, very uh, high. And I think it's something that especially uh, you're finding a lot more females now getting interested in magic. But I think it's very interesting for younger people. They, they love like I did when I was a kid. They love the idea of being able to do stuff that can fool people and or take our minds away from our everyday problems. Well, what is the most common feedback that you receive about your performances? Well, you know, people like they're going to tell me to my face they love it. So we <laughs> I get that a lot, obviously. Uh, so it's really hard for me to say exactly what people are thinking. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's bad. When I say it's bad, I really would like to know what people think when we're putting in a new routine, for example. Did they like it? Why did they like it? Was it too slow? Was it too fast? Was it, you know, and so sometimes I can't really read that and I have to just read the live reaction. Uh, and, and that becomes as a performer what we base most of our material on. So, you know, for me, when I'm standing, signing autographs after the show, they always say they loved it and I'm sure they do and I hope they do. But uh, in reality, I don't think they're ever going to come out and say, hey, you know what? We didn't really like it. It wasn't there, you know. So, but I mean, you can really read though that people did enjoy it. Uh, the face uh, never, never lies, right? When people have a smile, it's really hard to fake that. Do you ever make alterations to your show or add new tricks as your performance is seamless? So yeah, we do. And what's interesting, when we came back from, uh, from the lockdowns, we actually had to go back to some of our older material because we had some new stuff in right before we went into some of the shutdowns. And the reason we had to go back to the old materials because it wasn't quite, well, we, we, we weren't quite as solid in our thinking or in, in the retaining of it. So we do add new material throughout the year and, and we'll change things here and there. Uh, we don't change the whole show as one big whole. Say, for example, every year putting out a whole new show because we need to have that consistency. We need to know we have a base, a show that's going to work. Then we can take pieces out and put other pieces in. And from that, we can then create uh, newer, newer pieces and newer uh, parts of the show. Well, how long exactly does it take you to create a new element for your show? Ooh, great question. Yes. It depends. Look, I will say this, and it w when I was younger, it took a lot longer because A, when you're younger, you're maybe not as confident in your material or your performance. But I've also learned in the past, you can practice so much, but, and there's in our, in our business or in our industry, the saying is one hour live on stage with a piece of magic or material is like 10 hours of rehearsing in your basement. So there's a certain point we have to rehearse it so that it works and we're confident with it, but it also needs to get in front of the audience quicker because the longer we spend, it's, it's different as soon as you step out here on stage. The minute you're on stage, everything's different. So we try to get material in front of an audience as quick as we can. So we really average about two to three months on putting a piece in. Wow, now when I was watching your performance, I saw an array of different tricks. Uh, some where a girl was in a box and it looked like she was being cut and I, I, don't, I don't know how you do it, but it looked amazing. The illusion was uh, definitely, definitely tricked me. 
but um, also you have a number of card tricks and mm -hmm. even some interactive card tricks in your yes. performance. So right. um, I, I was trying to do that following along with you. What you do is a lot more advanced than the basic card tricks that you see on the schoolyard. How, how did you get your start in magic? Well, actually, uh, you say schoolyard. That's interesting because when I was a kid, my grandfather did little coin tricks and kind of goofy things. And he took me to see Doug Hennings when I was 12. Now, you won't know who Doug Henning is, but he was a magician back in the uh, 70s and early 80s. That was, was the big, you know, he was on TV. He had all these big touring shows. And I went to see that show and I said to my grandfather, this is what I want to do when I'm, when I'm older. And of course, you know, your parents go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I spent the next years going to, to libraries and to, uh, I remember Cole, there was a Kohl's bookstore in our mall, our local mall. And I'd go there every other week and check to see if they had any new magic books. So for me, it became like an obsession almost. And it was really hard back then to get that information. So when you did find out how a trick worked, it became very special. Uh, so I started at a very young age. By the time I was 15, I was doing birthday party shows and starting to branch out and getting into bigger magic. So I started quite young. Wow, so which performers might have influenced you the most at that time? Well, definitely Doug Hennings was a big inspiration to me. And, uh, you know, he, he was the one that for me really got me motivated and knew I wanted to be on stage, not just say doing close up magic at a restaurant or whatever. But then as I got older, there was a few other magicians that obviously I really uh, became or mentored. Uh, one of them being Lance Burton, who had his own show in Las Vegas. And of course, Siegfried and Roy, two of the best uh, showmen that you'll ever see in our business or well, probably in any business in that matter. Uh, so they all became like sort of mentors by watching them and seeing their career and try to, you know, follow along that path to get to where we are today. What is your favorite trick to perform today and why? <laughs> My favorite trick, wow, that's, that's an interesting, I get that a lot and it, it's a tough one, look. I think for me, it's not about, and I will tell you what my favorite trick is, but it's not necessarily because of the reason I'll say. You know, I always love levitation, and we actually have a levitation, a new one we're putting in, so we actually don't have one in the show right today. It will be in in a few weeks. But for me, really, I think what I really love about performing or the routines that I like the best are the ones that I get to communicate with the crowd. Because really, in the end of the day, it's that communication and that, that, that connection that we get. Uh, amongst humans and I think for me the minute I can go out and say hi to the folks and how are you and where are you from I try to really personalize it for the audience and I think that's important and I want to make people feel like they're not just watching this big show like a movie I want them to feel they're part of it. Do you train the parrots and tigers yourself? Uh, yeah so I not all myself in some respects let me answer that into two part that's kind of a with the birds, I do all the major training myself because a, um, as you know, with parrots, they like to bond or pick one person. They can socialize with others, but mm -hmm. I started working with parrots when I was about 17 years old. And I studied and took a course by a gentleman named Steve Martin, who's a bird trainer out of the States, one of the best. He does all like the Disney properties and stuff like that. And I took his course and I actually uh, started training my birds and became really really uh, good at it because I loved the, uh, the the time that I could spend with them. As far as the cats, I do work hand on hand and train them, but I have a gentleman at my side, his name's John Ferrara. He's been with me, I've known him for 25 years and he's been in the show now 16 years. He works beside me, we both train together because unfortunately, not unfortunately, but one of the things we don't want to ever do is take risks and they're, yes. you know, they're big animals. They are big sucks, they like to kiss and they, they, they're very affectionate but we always try to keep on the side of caution and make sure things stay safe. Uh, so yeah, we do uh, a lot of that work. And for me, I'm with them every day. Uh, these animals are my, my babies. They're home with me every day and uh, they're part of my life, so. Now watching your show, I can definitely tell that you are a huge animal lover and I can tell that yes. the animals definitely love you so much. Um, so what was the difference in training between the, the big cats and the birds? That must have been very different, very difficult. Well, actually, there is not a lot of differences in, in, in the basic uh, frame or structure of how we train. So when I learned from Steve Martin um, out of the gate, it was all positive reinforcement and done on a reward system, just like you would with a dog or if you've done with your bird. And it's a very positive way to work because A, 
uh, the animal gets engaged and gets a treat and gets to s feel like they've done something which is like a behavioral enrichment. They feel like they've achieved something. And it became very evident to me early on that it didn't always have to be a treat. It could be with some affection. You know, animals do like, uh, you know, they like that interaction. They understand what a kiss is. They understand the connection. So it doesn't always have to be with just a treat or a reward of, of food or whatever. Uh, the tigers work very much the same. I mean, uh, we, if you've noticed in the show, uh, I always have, when the cats are on stage, I always have, always have a little bit of uh, meat in my hands, little small pieces, and they eat right out of my hand, uh, and I'll feed them on stage as we're working. And that becomes their reward. And the two parts of that that's interesting is it's not just the food reward. Because they're eating out of my hand, they're getting that contact, that connection. So they get kind of a double, uh, you know, reward out of it. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things when you see their nature and how they were on stage, you probably notice they're very calm and relaxed. Even their body language will show you that they're very relaxed because we're there together. It's, it's like I always look at it as a team and, uh, you know, we have to work together and uh, it comes across and, and they love it. Well, obviously, I'm a big bird lover and so are you. How did you get your start handling birds? Your FISM award-winning bird act in 1994 was mesmerizing and inspiring. So actually, I, when I was about 14, I got to meet a gentleman named Doug Basham and he was a magician in Hamilton and he actually had a course. He could teach magicians and usually there was eight to 10 students in the class. And I found out about him and I called him up and I said, Doug, I want to learn this magic. I want to learn the sleight of hand and the manipulation and all the really cool magic stuff on stage. He says, well, unfortunately, I don't teach anymore because my groups got so small. It wasn't finan financially uh, possible for me to keep doing it. And I was really disappointed and I chatted with him for a little longer on the phone. And at the end of the conversation, he made a mistake. He said, if you have any other questions, give me a call. For a 14 year old that's interested in magic, I spent the next three days thinking of questions and I called him back. We chatted again and he was very kind to answer my questions and, and uh, two or three days after that, I called him again. By about the fifth call, he said to me, you really want to learn this magic stuff, don't you? And I said, yeah, I would do anything. And he was very kind and he took me on as a, as a solo student and taught me uh, all the manipulation and all the, uh, the stage magic at a more beginning level. But one part of that was working with the birds. My parents had parakeets growing up, so I was always familiar with birds and I always liked them. But now I realized that we can work them together with magic. So he was kind of the guy that introduced me to it. And from there, it just took off. And I did become one of the, in our industry, one of the top uh, workers of bird magic. Plus I won all the awards with that act. So for me, it was a really, really great, uh, great moment because not only could I do what I love, but I could work with animals. It was just another part of my life that I love. So it worked hand in hand. It worked out really great. Well, one thing for your performance, I noticed, oh, well, all the bird acts were amazing, to be honest. Um, Thank you. I, I could not believe uh, when you had a, a white piece of cloth, I believe, and this parrot went shooting out from it and it went free flying um, around uh, your show space. And it was just, it was just shocking. Honest, I, I don't know where you're hiding this parrot. And really, <laughs> as you can see, like parrots like to move around. Oh, They're yeah. a little, <laughs> they, they like to have fun. So I yeah. was, I was just shocked when the parrot came out of nowhere. I, 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 I can't believe it. So you are uh, truly like uh, such a great magician. Um, now in regards to parrot free flying, that has gained momentum and popularity within yes. North America, Europe, Australia, and South Asia. Do you off-leash free fly your parrots yes. in the Niagara area? Yes, um, we have 40 acres, so I can do it at my home. Uh, we tend to not do it close to a city environment. Unfortunately, with cars and different things, it gets to be a danger factor that I always worry about. So I never do any uh, free flying uh, outdoors unless I'm in an area that's more rural. Um, I actually have a good friend who teaches it down in the States and we got to spend some time together in Moab uh, in Utah free flying our birds out in the canyons and I'm telling you that was probably the and I got some video of that probably one of the greatest experiences I've ever had with my animals because you know to see these birds fly out uh, like I don't even know if, how many miles or how far it was it was so amazing to fly out that far and, and go out and soar and then come flying back almost to tell me like hey guess what I just saw or what I just did. Uh, it was really cool. And so, yeah, we get a chance uh, 
um, we get a chance quite a bit to do that and so yeah it's something that I really enjoy. Do you have any future projects or innovations in the works? Yeah, I'm always working on new stuff, but one of the things that I'm trying to do moving forward, and I think more so because of the time that we're in in our lives uh, and the things that we've gone through in these last few years, I'm actually starting to write more material that is driven by uh, stories of my life and parts of my life that are very important to me that I've always kept kind of to myself, but now I feel that I want to be a little more of a storyteller and share my experiences in life. And for example, one of them, and I'll kind of maybe put my arm up here. This wow. is one of my tigers right here. And he actually had cancer and he went through three different operations. Uh, he went into remission for two and a half years. Uh, it was a very long process to get him to that point. Unfortunately, after the two and a half years, the cancer came back and uh, it ended up winning out. It was a sad day for all of us here. As a matter of fact, I'll have to talk about this only very short because I start to get very emotional about it, but I, you know, I think people, I'd like people to understand a little more about how these animals and how parts of my life, uh, my life are reflected in my show. So I think that's the big thing that I'm going to start working on. We have three new routines coming in that are based on parts of my life. One of them being with, uh, with Boomer. So I think that for me is going to be the next step in what we do in our show. That's really sad about your tiger and pretty heartbreaking. Um, I know when, that's the circle of life, I guess you could say, but do you think you'll be introducing any other animals to your performances or any new acts? Yeah, you know, I think at this point now, I mean, as far as the animals are concerned, I, we, we have a lot. I'm not sure how many more we'll be introducing, but as far as the routines, definitely for sure, we'll be basing a lot of new routines coming up on, uh, you know, some of my, my, my life and whatnot. I'm always trying to evolve. And here's the other thing, it's not only just for the audience, it also becomes part for me because as a performer, you never want to get into that point where you're bored or just sort of tired of what you're doing because then the audience will feel that. And if the audience feels that, I feel that I'm not giving them what they came to see. They came to see a show with fun and excitement. If I'm not excited, the audience is not going to be excited. So I think that's the big key for me. Well, I'm really excited to check out your book, but on a point of that, is this magic uh, a generational? Do your kids know any tricks? They're probably animal lovers, but do they know any tricks as well? Well, yeah, my son went to magic camp. There used to be a magic camp in Toronto, just outside of Toronto for years, and he was really good. He had actually, uh, he had an ability for a sleight of hand that not a lot of kids have because of his uh, size of his hands and the way he could flex and how he could do different things. But the unfortunate thing is both of my kids grew up with magic. To them, it's not special. It's not something that they just look at it as, you know, they grew up with it. It's like, oh, that magic thing. So I don't see either of them taking on that role in the future as a, as a full-time performer. But they are definitely involved. My daughter, is uh, she trains and uh, competes in dressage horseback. And her and her boyfriend are right now out in Banff working at a dude ranch with horses. So uh, we're very, my family's very active with the animals. They, uh, we, you know, we have a lot of horses and my son as well. So I think they're going to be more along that path. I don't see them, you know, and it's really hard to do what I do. People look at it and go, hey, you make it look so easy. It must be fun. And it is, but it is a lot of work. And if you don't love this being on stage, it's not going to be something you'll do for a long time. So. Yeah, I don't see them becoming full-time magicians anytime soon. I, I think I actually hear some some little squeaks uh, in the background there. Do you, do you have any uh, feathery friends? Yeah, I do. Actually, if you give me like one second, yeah. I'll be right back and I'll bring one out and uh, say hi. She's not in the show at the moment. She's a rescue bird, but I know she would love to see you. So give me one minute. So this is Mika. Mika's about uh, six years old and she was a rescue bird. She came actually from down in the States and we brought her up here. She's a free flight bird and she likes to kiss. Where's my kiss? Kisses? So nice. The kisses are nice too, by the way. She's a very gentle kisser. Uh, she's actually looking around right now because we're in the theater and she wants to fly. Uh, but we'll keep her here for the moment. You having a good day? Yeah? Can I have another kiss? Yeah? Where's my kisses? One more? One more? So nice. The kisses are so gentle. <laughs> anyway, she's a blue and gold macaw and she loves to fly outside. Uh, that's one of her favorite things. She loves to fly anywhere, but she is a good girl, yeah. Does she know any tricks? 
Uh, not really. So we don't really, I don't really work with my birds to do like, they can wave and do different things. Um, but I don't really spend a lot of time on that. I like to do a little more with them. I do a little more, uh, you know, uh, natural behaviors, let them fly, being able to come back, things like that. My Scarlet Macaw, he can wave, he can say about 20 different words on command. Uh, he's now almost 30 years old, so he's getting up there in age. Uh, so yeah. Are you a good girl? Oh, oh so good. so sweet. Yeah. yeah, she's a sweetie. Well, your birds in your performance are, I don't know how you're able to do the tricks with them, but I can see definitely such a love of animals and you can even see with her, she reacts so well and I don't know what kind of home she came from uh, prior to being with you, but it's so great that she, she is now with such a great home and she's so well looked after. Yeah, and you know, I, I, I thank you for that. And I always try to tell people, I've had a lot of people that come to our show and they get inspired and they want to get a parrot because they see me and, but I always will tell people, and I'll say this to you as well, and you will know this, I always caution people to get a bird like this. You have to really know what they're about. Don't just buy this bird because he's beautiful or she's very, um, you know, gorgeous looking. There's a lot more to it, as you know. And if you don't understand their behaviors and how to work with them, you find a lot of times that people get into where they don't want them anymore. And the problem with parrots is they like to bond with one person. So yeah. it's a very it's a very difficult process. We've had to home a lot of birds over our years here. And I can tell you, it takes a long time. So I always try to caution people, make sure you know what you're doing. Do this for the bird, not for you. And if you can follow that part of it, you might be able to get into having a bird like this and find out how rewarding they are to have as a pet, which I know you know. So Greg, with such an amazing show that I did watch, how, how does one get tickets to this hot show? Well, if I told everybody to close their mind and magically think of it and it would appear in front of them, that would be awesome, but we can't really do it that way. <laughs> so we actually have a website and of course the theater here has a phone number. So the website is uh, www.gregfruintheater.com and that's of course spelled R-E for theater, like the Canadian way. Uh, and our phone number is 905-356-0777. We have staff here during the day and during the night and they're always willing to help and uh, take your orders if you want to come and see the show. It's a real fun show, and I know you'll have a great time. Well, thank you so much, Greg Fruin, for spending time with me, for taking the time out to talk with me, and I loved your show. It was amazing. Maybe I'll come see it again sometime next time in, I'm in Niagara Falls. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, and I appreciate your time, and uh, your little one there, give him a kiss for me. Is it a he or a she? I never asked. It's a he. His name's Sebastian. Sebastian. Well, Sebastian's been a great boy, and I, he's, he's done this whole entire interview sitting there so nicely. So I hope you guys have a great day, and thanks for talking with me. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming on the show. You can find Greg Fruin's Theatre in Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada. Also, you can find out more information about the shows and showtimes at gregfruintheatre.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Julia Cosby, and you're watching Inbox with Julia Cosby on the International News Channel at TAG TV.